Um, we're about to start today's second quarterly legislative program, and I have the pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's program, Ms. Sheila Thornton, President and CEO of One Future Coachella Valley. Please, as she walks up, I... We have to let you know a little bit about her and her background. Um, she's an she's an amazing convener. She is an amazing leader in the Coachella Valley to make sure that different partners are coming together to resolve the issues on a daily basis for the Coachella Valley. One future Coachella Valley is a partner for CSUV as we work to increase the educational attainment rate. Sheila is guided by One Future's mission to assure that all students succeed in college, career, and life expanding and enhancing the local workforce so that our youth and economy continue to thrive. Prior to the formation of One Future Coachella Valley, Sheila served as a Vice President of Workforce Excellence for Coachella Valley Economic Partnership, where she led coalition building, fundraising, and program development for that division. You know that, hard, that how hard that can be when you're growing each program, and we are, are blessed, quite frankly, with her and her vision to continue those focuses to, to again grow those partnerships. She also has served on our CSUSB Palm Desert Advancement Board as president, Growing Inland Achievement Board of Directors, National Team for the Ford Motor Company Fund Next Generation Learning Initiative, and a National Advisory Committee for Health Career Connection. She is a former board member of Linked Learning Alliance in California and California's Future Health Workforce Commission. So with that, can you please join me in a warm Welcome to Sheila Thornton. Thank you. Always humbled. Thank you. That's a very warm welcome. Great to be here today. Um, and I'm only up here for a minute so that I can in introduce Rafiq. Um, but welcome, everyone. Uh, couldn't be a more important topic, not just because um, Health care delivery depends on it, but also because our, our the future of our community in terms of thriving, well-being, economic well-being, um, and true care for those who have been um, the most affected by inequities. So this is a very important topic to all of us. Um, I'm going to start by introducing Rafiq Mohammed, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, so he can welcome folks. Good morning, everybody. I think it's still it's still morning, right? All right. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to be here with all of you uh, this morning and uh, to offer a brief, Marisa said, make it brief. Uh, <laughs> welcome uh, to today's legislative legislative briefing hosted by CSUSB's Office of Government and Community Relations and, of course, Kaiser Permanente. Uh, today's focus revolves around the theme, Bridging the Gap, innovative programs and policy changes to address healthcare workforce needs in the Inland Empire. Uh, and as that title suggests, this briefing, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, panelists, this briefing aims to offer a comprehensive overview of the multifaceted challenges encountered in the Inland Empire's healthcare sector, particularly those challenges associated with the healthcare workforce pipeline. Um, I was told not to go off script. I was told to stick to my two minutes. But, uh, you know, I, I think we all know that the Inland Empire is uh, one of the fastest growing regions, if not the fastest growing region in California. Uh, and and so uh, any gaps in terms of health care provision uh, are exacerbated by that reality. Um, the the I, I was looking at some reports by from Kaiser and some other folks yesterday uh, in preparation for this. And it, it just echoed things I already knew, which is that uh, the IE has persistent shortages of physicians, nurses, PAs. Uh, and other uh, healthcare workers. Inland Southern California has the lowest rate of uh, primary care and specialty care physicians of any region in the state of California. And by way of comparison, if you look at the San Francisco Bay Area, they have almost twice as many uh, 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 healthcare providers as the IE does. Uh, so that's, that's pretty stark. There are also issues with respect to ensuring that the healthcare workforce reflects the diversity of the IE. Uh, and and there are uh, other kind of persistent uh, issues of structural racism and uh, associated inequalities uh, that contribute to unequal access with respect to health care uh, in, in, in the country, but certainly uh, more acutely so here uh, in the IE. So that's kind of the first point or the first uh, 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 aim of today's uh, 
talk, but also it will showcase the impactful healthcare education programs we already have and those that we are developing uh, here at CSUSB, uh, and also focus on present policy changes uh, that are essential for fostering workforce development uh, here in, in the IE. Uh, the last thing I'll say is just kind of what we're about here in the California State University system and also uh, at CS CSUSB. Um, we are, uh, if President Morales were here, uh, he would talk about us being an anchor institution. Uh, and, and that's not just lip service. We are dedicated as a campus uh, uh, and, and as a representative of the California State University system uh, to serve the people of California. Uh, and there's no more important service that we could perform uh, at this stage in the Inland Empire than playing a key role in uh, workforce development in healthcare in uh, the Inland Empire. Uh, so I look forward to today's conversation. Uh, and I also look forward to us being called upon as an institution uh, to, to, to fulfill that obligation that we have uh, to this community uh, and to the people of the IE. So once again, uh, thank you to Kaiser and to uh, Kaiser Permanente, I should say, <laughs> and, and, and to our Office of Government Relations, Government and Community Relations uh, for hosting today's event. Thank you to our panelists and thank you everybody else uh, for being here today. Oh, and I forgot, <laughs> it is my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce Georgina Garcia, Senior Vice President and Area Manager of Kaiser Permanente San Bernardino County Service Area. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Well, so as you heard, I'm Georgina Garcia, and I am the Senior Vice President Area Manager in San Bernardino County, uh, which is one of our service areas, the entirety of the county, um, the largest county, as you know, in, in the United States of America. Um, and, uh, and we're here to um, talk about uh, something that's near and dear to Kaiser Permanente's heart, that's for sure. And we're very excited to be here as part of CSUSB's uh, quarterly legislative briefing. I'm actually a product of the sister facility in Los Angeles. Uh, my undergrad degree is from Cal State Los Angeles. And we're going to have, um, I think, a great discussion on this very important healthcare workforce issues uh, topic that affects our region. But before I delve into a little bit of that and some detail around that, I'd like to provide you just a little bit of background on Kaiser Permanente, if you would indulge me uh, in that. Um, Kaiser Permanente is an integrated healthcare delivery system, and we're comprised of three entities, Kaiser Foundation Hospitals, Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, and then the Permanente Medical Groups. We're one of the nation's largest not-for-profit health plans, serving more than, 20, than uh, 12 million members nationally and nearly 5 million members in Southern California. 680,000 of those members are in San Bernardino County. And SBC is the birthplace of Kaiser Permanente. Many of you may know that the first KP-built hospital was in Fontana at the site of the old Kaiser steel mill. Today, with Fontana and Ontario Medical Centers, we have over 500 inpatient beds, 20 medical offices, four target clinics, and we have more than 10,000 physicians and staff who serve in all of these facilities and serve those 680,000 members. We're very proud to be one of the largest employers in the area and the employer of choice with strong leadership, competitive pay, a very engaged workforce, meaningful work, and a very team-based organizational culture. It's something I personally value very highly about Kaiser Permanente. We are one team. So now turning to that workforce development and education topic. The link between education and health, I think is very well known by everyone in this room, well documented. Those with higher levels of education are more likely to be healthier and live longer. So supporting education is an important, important part of our community health program at Kaiser Permanente. Various education programs we support include pipeline programs, such as Hippocrates Circle for middle school students, KP Summer Youth Employment Program, and the Healers Day Program as well for high school students, and graduate medical education. 
Our physicians and leaders also serve as faculty at local medical colleges and residency programs throughout the county. We also partner with the Fontana, the San Bernardino, Rialto, Colton, Hesperia, Victor Elementary, Pomona, and Ontario Montclair School Districts to support their health professions and mental health programs through our Thriving Schools Initiative, which serves students, teachers, and staff at all of those locations. Additionally, KP trains future physicians through the KP School of Medicine and the KP Community Medicine Fellowship. Our partnership with CSUSB is another important pathway that we support. Over the last few years, we have provided $250,000 in grant funding to the university and recently provided $25,000 grant to the Palm Desert Campus's Street Medicine Program. We love that. The program provides health care to the unhoused and vulnerable populations in the Coachella Valley, as well as engages nursing students in the practice of clinical health care. We're also the training ground for the next generation of healthcare professionals. At both of our medical centers, we provide Cal State San Bernardino students and students of other colleges alike the opportunity to undertake their clinical nursing rotations, provide supervised clinical hours for social work graduate students going into the mental health field, and rotations for future dietitians. KP also has supports UCSUSB on campus student programs. These include culturally competent behavioral health training for psychology and social work graduate students, early childhood trauma informed care teacher certificate program. That's a mouthful and sounds like a very good certification. Um, the student nursing lab and the student food pantry, just to name a few. As you can tell, and I hope you can hear that clearly, that Kaiser Permanente is highly committed to developing our local talent to be the next generation of healthcare professionals for our region. Across many areas, we work to inspire and support people to be healthier in all aspects of their lives and build strong, healthier communities with many of you who are our partners in that endeavor. Again, thank you so very much for inviting Kaiser Permanente to be a part of this important discussion as we work to solve these issues together. Much health always to all of you. And I think I have Sheila Thornton come back up. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. We see Kaiser's influence in the Coachella Valley and we thank you for that. It's excellent. All right. So, um, I uh, have some prepared remarks. I'm not typically a reader, but Moral gave me some prepared remarks, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to do that just on behalf of the uh, Moral. Thank you for joining us today for this timely conversation on bridging the gap, innovating innovative programs and policy changes to address healthcare workforce needs in the Inland Empire. Considering the pandemic's impact on our already strained healthcare workforce. Addressing the gaps in healthcare delivery has become increasingly urgent, as you all know. This session delves into the challenges faced in the Inland Empire, offering insights into innovative programs and policy changes crucial for workforce development. Our goal is to equip attendees with actionable strategies to enhance the healthcare workforce pipeline and ensure equitable healthcare access for our community's future. This is all about us deciding to work together. You'll hear that in, I think, everyone's comments here. Um, it is uh, now is the time more than ever for us to connect the dots. That is what it's about. It, no longer can we do this in isolation, but we have to think backwards from the goal um, of a, a thriving, uh, responsive workforce for the future of our Inland Empire. So as part of bridging the gap, I'm gonna just share a little bit about One Future's work in the Coachella Valley. And I think I need a, unless somebody can click for me. The One Future Coachella Valley is um, an organization that's called a backbone. Oh, I think I can move to this, here you go. One Future Coachella Valley, test, test. There you go. We're a backbone organization for what's called the Regional Plan for College and Career Success. And uh, we started in 2017, um, actually in 2005, uh, under the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership initially. And the concept then was 
Uh, education is economic development. Further, education is critical to economic mobility, especially for the students who are most in need. And at the time, the concept was also bring folks in from outside. Uh, if you wanted to, you wanted to attract uh, economic diversification, you really needed to increase intellectual capital. But when we delved into that, we saw that the 70,000 students who were in our school districts at the time were largely in poverty. And those who came from families who had degrees and education were going outside the valley uh, to go to school for four-year university. And they were generally speaking, not having the, any of the same issues that our, the rest of our students were. Many of our students were being held back because of geographic isolation, because they were in significant poverty, uh, and because they didn't have pathways into the jobs that existed. So at the time, 80% of our employers said that they were going, I mean, sorry, our employers were saying they're going 80% of the time outside the valley to recruit for high wage positions. That included healthcare. So that's why One Future was started. And I'm starting with this just to sort of, I hope we can wrap today um, and think about the context of the speakers today um, uh, from the frame of how we do this in an interoperable way. How do we address the issues of healthcare workforce in, in, in that way? That means institutions, it means ground floor, it means understanding what communities need and what resources are in communities to be able to align. And it's also to understand the nuances. The Inland Empire is not one uh, individual, you know, homogenous area. It really is made up of communities that have varying degrees of challenges for our students. So it's really important for us to think both at that uh, those anchor institution level, but also from the perspective of where are there natural ways that we can work together to get at the issues of, of workforce. I said this, and I'm just going to um, reinforce it. Poverty in the Coachella Valley for students in the K-12 districts is increasing, not decreasing. And the issue of health workforce, not just in the Coachella Valley, but it re is reflected across the state and nation. The issue of health workforce is not just about the number of, of uh, the deficit, right? The empty spots. The issue is about the mismatch. Are the students who come from our region actually getting the support they need all along their pipeline to be able to get into those positions? And that takes a really upstream uh, body of work for us to get to that and support them along the way. So large majority of our students are in uh, our students who students of color and students who are on free and reduced lunch, 30% of our students are in poverty. Um, but but as a result of that, we've had to be very deliberate in the area to make sure that we do a regional approach to supporting them across their, their pathways. One Futures concept is about the entire community. It's a holistic view of workforce development and educational attainment. It is building a talent, talented workforce from within assuring that we are focused on education as a path out of poverty, making sure that we're doing work in an inclusive way. We do a lot of work to bring together 300 plus leaders who are working on strategy teams to get this regional plan done. And then last, be attentive to what e the economic uh, conditions are, because if a student is living in a, in a place where they are left behind from access perspective, from just from access to basic services, and they can't even get to the point of enrollment, and their education is insufficient for them to be able to get to enrollment, our healthcare workforce efforts at the college level are moot, right? We need to really get past that issue. So the economy is, is the context for the students. We do the work around this regional plan for college and career success, and the first slide I showed was at the Cal State Palm Desert campus, it's an anchor in the Coachella Valley, and it needs to be. The, those higher education institutions are critical for us, as are the employers. Our employers are very engaged in the work that we're doing. Um, the, the work that we do focuses on creating common regional goals. They are North Star goals that we iterate on year over year. Um, and we keep folks at the table to stay on those goals that we know will be drivers. We work in sectors and healthcare is one of the sectors. And there's a lot that I could tell you about it, but I'm just gonna go right to our most recent sort of advancement around it. Across the 17 years, we've been doing work in health career academies at the high school level. We do scholarships and financial aid, holistic support services for students to persist and complete degrees, uh, internships and work-based learning for students. Uh, but we also now are at a place where we need to land the plane. How are we actually getting those students into the job? And that's harder than we all think. The job can exist, uh, but if they don't have social capital, transportation, <laughs> um, the 
all the, the things that derail them, uh, issues of, of um, single parenthood, et cetera, uh, then we can't get the job done. So we brought together the executive leadership of the three hospitals in the Coachella Valley, uh, Eisenhower and um, the two, Eisenhower and the three actually uh, tenant hospitals, along with IHP and Desert Healthcare District, to start thinking together. Yes, those are they are in a competitive position, but we decided that this is our issue together, that we cannot afford to work in competition with one another any longer. We are going to be of one voice when we talk about the health workforce because of all the implications. This is the shared commitment that that group has made, and they decided to start, start incrementally. Let's figure out what our biggest issue is. Right now, it's the RN pipeline. We're going to start there, create a structure for us to speak and think together and co-invest together. Uh, as uh, Marissa spoke to, it's not easy stuff. <laughs> and uh, it is it is a, a real sort of tranche to kind of get through it, if that's a word. I can't <laughs> but to get through the details of staying at the table, defining what your targets are together, and then figuring out how you're going to work together, that's critical. I just wanted to uh, open with that because I think every one of the speakers today can speak so well to the individual contributions that organizations make, institutions, but also understand the context that the student comes from, the community from which and the conditions uh, within which they are living. Um, and I, when I looked at your presentations, I could see that all over them. So I really appreciate that. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. And I think first I have a bit of um, business to do our audience for the audience. The full bios for the speakers are in your folders there, in your blue folders. And if you're joining via live stream, the materials were shared via email. So at the end of our, we're going to have our panelists uh, come up and speak. At the end of it, we'll do, uh, we'll be open for questions. So hold your questions until then. And I think you're going to enjoy this. So let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Bennett is a distinguished psychiatrist known for her leadership in mental health care, with a background in psychobiology and medicine from UCLA and UC Irvine, respectively. She now serves as Chief of Psychiatry for Kaiser Permanente in San Bernardino County. Dr. Bennett is passionate about education, having helped establish the first Kaiser Permanente Psychiatry Residency Program in the US. She also mentors medical students at Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine and Western University Health Sciences. I'm sorry, Western University Health Sciences University. Got an extra one in there. Dr. Bennett's ex expertise and dedication have earned her key leadership roles, including appointment as regional physician lead of mental health and wellness strat strategy since 2022. Welcome, Dr. Bennett. Right. Well, good morning, everyone. It really is um, an honor and a privilege to be, you know, here with you today. Um, so I will just give you a brief background. So I'm actually from the Inland Empire, you know, grew up in the Inland Empire and then went on my educational journey. And when I was ready to kind of settle with my family, um, I brought them back to the one wonderful Inland Empire, which really is near and dear to my heart. So I just really appreciate, you know, being um, in a space with so many people that are passionate about our community and um, want to work together, you know, to, to help build and grow. So um, I'm going to give you just a few background statistics, which I don't think is going to be, you know, a, a shocker to anyone in this in this room. But there has been just a huge explosion, you know, exponential growth in demand for mental health services. And um, we're really seeing, you know, that impacting our youth, you know, greatly and our young adult population. So just to kind of share some of the statistics, um, you know, the mental health crisis among adolescents just boomed during the COVID pandemic. We saw emergency room visits that went up for suicide attempts by over 50%. Um, for adolescent girls, you know, from 2019 to 2021. And in 2021, there were more than 40% of students that felt persistently sad or hopeless and nearly one third that experienced poor mental health. We saw a four times increase in depression and triple the rates of anxiety. Uh, we had about 12% of our population that considered suicide in the, in the past month. And um, alongside the mental health crisis, we also saw an surgence of, of uh, substance use issues. 
And so um, just wanted to kind of highlight some of these, you know, key areas in terms of the populations that are, you know, hit uh, the most. Um, our young adult population, age 18 to 25, one in four individuals actually have a mental health diagnosis. Um, from age 26 to 49, it's about 22% of our, our population. So this is really, you know, it's very important that, you know, we're working together and we're figuring out a, a solution. Um, just to give you some statistics on, you know, substance use treatment. So um, the in 2019, the rate of overdose from drug use, you know, was over 71,000. Um, we're seeing a growing number of people that have substance use diagnoses, and we know that there's a, a shortage of, you know, clinicians and a shortage of treatment facilities for these patients. Nearly 89% of people in need of a substance use, you know, treatment program did not receive it. So um, over 50% of Americans need a mental health treatment are not receiving services. Those are staggering numbers. We are seeing, uh, we're, we're walking into sort of an avalanche of a dearth of providers. So 45% of psychiatrists and 37% of psychologists are over 60 years old. By 2028, California will have 50% fewer psychiatrists and 28% fewer psychologists, MFTs, clinical counselors, and social workers than needed really to meet this growing demand. So this is some data just within, you know, Kaiser Permanente. And, you know, it's been a, a very, very challenging time, as we all are well aware. We saw from 2019 to 2022, a 36% increase in mental health visits just within our system. Um, and, you know, it as we know in this room, it's not easy just to grow the workforce overnight. And not only are you having a, a huge explosion in demand, but also the mental health clinicians are feeling the impact in their personal lives, right? So as we're trying to care for others, um, no one was really untouched by COVID. And so it we did see a real challenge with, you know, turnover, with people kind of reevaluating their lives and, you know, opting to kind of do other things. So you're trying to kind of keep up with all of the demand in the community while simultaneously you're you're in that, you know, pandemic yourself and, and feeling the impact in your personal life. So really our mission, what we stand behind is really to provide, you know, high quality care and to address the stigma of mental health and addiction conditions through our integrated holistic delivery system. And we're focused on, you know, the health and well-being, not only of our members, but really of our communities. Um, and we really need to stand up and we need to deliver the care, you know, at the right place at the right time when individuals need it. So what are we doing? I think this was sort of uh, what what we're looking for today. And, you know, what is Kaiser Permanente doing really to um, build that pipeline? And I just want to say that everything that on this slide here is actually new from just the last several years. So these are the programs that we've uh, stood up, starting with the Mental Health Scholars Academy. So um, you know, we really want uh, an ability to get people interested in working as a mental health clinician, right? So there's a lot of folks, as we mentioned, that may not have, you know, exposure. They may not have anyone in their family, you know, to kind of look up to and, and consider these careers. And so um, it really is about taking folks that work within, you know, Kaiser Permanente and um, providing an avenue to support uh, tuition and to support them exploring a career in, in mental health. So Kaiser does offer um, tuition, so 75% tuition assistance to pursue a master's degree in clinical counseling and marriage and family therapy and social work. Um, so that starts the pipeline. And then the other program that is new over the past several years and is run regionally, and we also, I can talk more about just what we've done in SBC specifically, is our uh, Behavioral Health Training Institute. And so that really offers, you know, interns those practicum hours for their clinical experience. Um, and there's many schools that we partner with. 
and including, you know, your very own Cal State San Bernardino. Um, and then again, you want to be able to offer that next level. So um, we we offer, you know, graduates from the Behavioral Health Training Institute the opportunity to apply for careers with, as an associate. And so again, that is a program that uh, has just developed over the past several years of being able to hire associates. And we know that you're investing a lot. So we have um, robust educational programs, evidence-based medicine training programs, quality programs, clinical supervision. And um, it's just, it's a great, in San Bernardino County with just the diversity of the population that we serve, it really offers a great, you know, clinical experience for our associates. And then finally, we need jobs, right? And so after they graduate and they complete all these steps, you know, we want to make sure that they uh, have a job and can be placed once they're licensed. And so we've had um, an addition of, you know, many positions. So we've hired over 600 um, therapists, you know, since 2020. All right. And just to speak a little bit more about the Behavioral Health Training Institute, um, you know, the uh, interns in this program have seen over 7,000 patients. Um, we have 49 total trainees in the pipeline and already have 32 graduates. 50% of the graduates in 2022 actually were hired into a KP associate position. And so just as important it is, as it is to hire them internally, we also value putting people out in the community with our other community partners. And um, outside of our Behavioral Health Training Institute, we actually have a local partnership with um, CSUSB that's been in existence, you know, for, for quite some time now. And so we do have interns that are rotating out of our clinics, our psychiatry clinics within San Bernardino County. And just within our clinics alone in SBC, we've actually hired 44 associates since 2022. And finally, I want to talk about it. This is something very near and dear to my heart. And so we also mentioned just the shortage of physicians in the pipeline. And so um, we started the first ever Kaiser Permanente in the nation uh, general psychiatry residency training program. And I was part of that physician group that put that together. And it's located here in our very own San Bernardino County. Um, since then, there's been several other programs that have developed out of Northern California. Uh, we have six residents per year, and we have um, rotations in partnership with San Bernardino County Department of Behavioral Health, with Loma Linda Medical Center, and with Arrowhead Regional Medical Center. So our total complement is 24, you know, physicians in our general psychiatry residency program. And then we are the, the first and still the only child psychiatry fellowship training program in the country out of the Permanente Medicine Group. Um, and we have two uh, CAP fellows per year, child and adolescent fellows per year. And again, partnerships with some of our local schools, with Fontana Unified School District, with Loma Linda Medical Center, and with the San Bernardino County Department of Behavioral Health. All right, and I will stop there and answer questions later, but thank you guys so much for, for your time. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. What an impressive, you know, what really strikes me there is the pipeline, the deliberate pipeline and the concept of leading, the employers leading the way and supporting students in that through their bachelor's degree um, while they're working. You know, that's an, an incredible resource. Thank you. Next up, um, is, I have a hard time calling her Dr. Oti because it's Sonia Oti, Dr. Oti to me, but um, wonderful leader that's starting the MSPA program here. Um, Dr. Oti is currently leading the development of the Masters of Science and Physician Assistant, the MSPA program at Cal State University, with prior experience as the founding program director at Keck Graduate Institute. She successfully launched their MSPA program and secured substantial grants for PA facilities. Dr. Oti's diverse background includes clinical practice as a PA and consultancy in PA education. She is dedicated to promoting diversity within the PA profession and improving healthcare access in underserved communities. 
Holding degrees from Nova, Southeastern University, and the University of Lynchburg, Dr. Oti's ex expertise extends to academia, publication, and advocacy for culturally competent healthcare. And I, I have the privilege of serving on uh, Dr. Oti's advisory uh, board for the MSPA program, and I'm incredibly impressed with the specific responsiveness to the Inland Empire and providing uh, the, the support and the, the concept of the holistic support for the student, thinking of the stu student from that perspective and also um, embedding uh, preference for admission requirements because it's exactly what we need to be able to serve the students in the area. So welcome, Dr. Oti. Thank you very much for having me. I wanted to, of course, continue this conversation about addressing healthcare shortages uh, in the Inland Empire, but now from a higher education perspective. So a lot of us are pretty familiar with the fact that there is a severe primary care shortage, um, but to see, now is this in PowerPoint or in, uh, is there a way to get this in PowerPoint instead of on PDF? You'll see all of my tricks before I get to them. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> well, I can talk momentarily while we get going here. Um, so the national deficit of physician jobs is at 139,000. And unfortunately, of the 50 states here, California is the most represented. And they take up nearly a quarter of that deficit at around 32,000. This is a severe issue when we're only one of 50 states, but we make up nearly a quarter of that issue. Now, even whenever you add on physician assistants and nurse practitioners to that calculation, uh, you still will have a deficit by 2030 of about 10,000 jobs. I think we're almost there. <laughs> All right, hopefully you're audio learners. I'll, I'll, talk, <laughs> I'll talk a little bit more. Um, so the recommendation for primary care providers is to have 60 to 80 primary care providers per 100,000 people. And unfortunately in the Inland Empire, we have just about half that at 41 primary care providers per 100,000 people. So we have lots of work to do um, in this space. So what can we do? <laughs> This was probably gonna be a lot better with the PowerPoint, but um, so what can we do? Now, it seems like the obvious solution to increase the workforce would be to train more providers and get them out into the workforce, right? Well, let's see what that would look like now. Now I will need the visual for this because it's really hard to describe bar graphs. <laughs> yeah. <you need> yeah. <laughs> to have Diana do her. Sure, we can come back. Would that work? Is we're all in the? Would that work if we could pull up her PowerPoint version? Have Diana go forward with the? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. You want to do that? Just sure. We're going to be. We'll come back. We'll come back with part two. Okay. Good. <laughs> Let me get my notes. For them. Apologies for that. I'm going to introduce Diana Fox, and this will be relevant. Diana is going to talk about the um, the healthcare workforce landscape in the co in the Inland Empire, uh, and I think that that will help sort of set up for Dr. Ot next. So Diana Fox is a recognized leader in health equity in Southern California's Inland Empire, serving as executive director of Reach Out. Under her guidance, Reach Out has impacted over two million residents, notably through initiatives like the Inland Empire Bill of Rights. Since 2007, the organization has led efforts in health workforce diversity and training, including programs like the Inland, uh, I'm sorry, the Inland Health Professions Consortium and Community Health Worker Training. Ms. Fox's leadership extends to community mobilization and collaboration, evident in initiatives like the Latino Health Collaborative and the Center for Civic Policy and Leadership. She also co-chairs the San Bernardino County Community Vital Signs Initiative and co-founded the National Innovative Communities Conference. Through her work, Ms. Fox continues to drive crucial change and promote health equity. Welcome, Diana. Great to have you here.
this is. Uh, start with this, or maybe not, because I have to click. I'm not like ambidextrous, I don't think. Well, thank you so much. Um, it is such an honor just to be able to be here with these amazing speakers and with all of you. And I do have a lot of slides, but I promise, and I'm going to go fast uh, because there's a lot of data. And yes, want to focus on some of the data because I think there's a lot of people in the room that can impact what the numbers are going to show. And um, and some of the things, this data that I'm going to be presenting today is literally hot off the press uh, as of within the last two months. And so uh, very up to date. So, uh, and again, I'm gonna go fast, but don't worry. I think the PowerPoint will be available to everyone if you want it. So, um, so I'm gonna skip this completely, uh, <laughs> but, one of the things, and you already heard this, right? Our region is the fastest growing in the state. I think it's so important when you put numbers around it too, in that top yellow green box, that we will have half of the state's population growth here in the Inland Empire over the next few years. And that is huge. And I was talking with someone earlier here in the room, I always say like, ignore the IE at your peril because we are the next big thing, right? We Well, we're already the big thing. So <laughs> really just want to be able to highlight that. Um, Riverside County is actually the fastest growth. I put San Bernardino County there. San Diego is actually second, but I put them down here. <laughs> so, um, but San Bernardino County, I think is fourth fastest growing. Um, so just some great numbers to know there uh, to kind of put the whole thing into perspective of 50% of the population growth of the state is going to be here. That's really important. Okay. This one, you need like an hour just to pull this one apart. But I want you to have this data and it shows like between the next few years and where populations are going to be in the next few years, where they are now, where they'll be uh, according to how many folks we will have here in the IE, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this again. It's um, a lot, but I think the biggest thing, and I don't know if this thing has a, a, a pointer, up at the top right, the living wage now for the Inland Empire is $25.77. Two years ago, it was in the $18. It's a $7 increase in living wage for our region. That... There's a lot behind that. I don't have time to talk about it. If you have a child, oh my gosh, right? Now you go up to a 42.52 living wage to be able to support yourself and a child. So uh, thinking about why it's so important to have these beautiful high wage jobs that are in health is all the more reason why we need to be investing in this area. Ah, there we go. So actually I said two years ago, so this is... This is our living wage right here. Um, and something to be considering as you're really thinking about what occupations, especially if you're an educator, are you pushing your young people to? And are they currently paying a living wage? Skip. Uh, this one is really all about how many healthcare jobs there are in our region. I won't spend a lot of time on this. You know it's a lot. We're at about 10.3% in public and private healthcare. A lot of times the numbers will actually also include this square, social assistance, that uh, is like my work. I work in a nonprofit. Um, and being able to put those two together, we actually have larger employment in the social assistance health workforce than in the logistics industry. And many of the health supports, like I can't tell you how many Cal State public health uh, graduates are working at Reach Out uh, and many other things. So huge amount of folks in the nonprofit sector as well. The other thing really important to know, if you look at the healthcare, uh, how many jobs, I highlighted it up there in yellow, has a second to that thing up at the top that I'm gonna ignore. But again, if you uh, add in the social assistance, we actually have more jobs coming in 
to healthcare and social assistance than we do into any other sector. Okay, so this one, sorry, I even have to look at this. It's a little challenging, you guys. Okay, I'm gonna switch over if this one's still on. Okay, so being able to look at this one and say, um, where are the jobs by degree? And if you look, so we, we already established that the living wage is about 25.77 right now, that even with a high school diploma, if you're in health, you can still be making almost living wage with a high school diploma. And if you get even an associate's degree, it jumps up to 35.19 an hour. And then bachelor's, and then obviously advanced degrees, master's and doctoral um, jump significantly. And so if you look at all of those, um, it just gives you an idea of the opportunities that we have. So these, these next few slides, I call them, yes, we know there's a healthcare worker shortages, but you already heard a little bit about retirements coming up that are looming, right? So here we have just a kind of a smat smattering of uh, professions. With advanced degrees, dentists, 27% are retiring, orthodontists, 26%, at the bachelor's degree level, respiratory therapists and medical records specialists. All of those are retiring within the next 10 years. And then if we also look at so these are some equity data, the next two slides, of really looking at where do we have majority male employed versus female employed. And I won't spend a ton of time on this. I think it points out though, some outreach efforts that we need to do differently and the messaging that we do and how we do that. And then this is the majority female employed. And while not all of these are lower income jobs, most of them are. Okay. so. Again, very important when you think about the level of the jobs where most of the women are working, and they may also be supporting single parent households, not that men don't also, but uh, so just something to note. So our, our Latinx population um, is still looking at where the advanced degrees are and bachelor, et cetera, and how, how many folks we have there. Um, we know that our region is predominantly Latinx, and so we want to also just take note of that and where we currently are. And as you see in our advanced degree, only 27.6% of the Latinx population has that advanced degree. Okay, here we go. Here are just some of the wages. And this is some of my favorite data always is the gap data. So the very right-hand column in the kind of tannish brown, um, we have a training gap of 182 nurse practitioners, uh, 75 pharmacists, registered nurses, always, uh, as Sheila spoke to, they focused in on nursing uh, because it is, I've been doing this work for almost 20 years now, and this number doesn't get that much better. It's been a really tough number to move. It's getting a little better. Uh, but a huge gap there still. And then also in just in, you know, in a hospital or in a clinic setting where you have managers that are managing healthcare management. Uh, also, that is a, something that we don't always think about. I'm going to go over these two really quickly. This massage therapist one, though, kind of surprised me. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And good wages there for those. But I wanted to get to the community health workers this is completely tied to the Cal Lame work that the state, you know, has been working on for so long around Medi-Cal and access to health and moving more towards population level health. And so we see a huge training gap in community health workers. And, um, and that is one of the things that Reach Out actually is, uh, we are training CHWs to help meet that gap as well. We also, right now, we're working on a whole public health workforce report for the Inland Empire that will be get released in June um, that we're very excited about and really looking at the occupations for our public health departments. As you know, during the pandemic, our public health departments, they already had shortages, 
huge shortages even just going into the pandemic. And then during the pandemic wound up with many more shortages. People just got burnt out. And a lot of people that delayed retiring during the pandemic then retired because there was already that uh, cliff of retirements coming for public health even before the pandemic. So these are, I'm going to go over this one really quick. But if you look at the openings, and these are pretty scrunched together, but if you look at all these openings and add all those together, if we could fill all those openings with our local young people, how amazing would that be? And how much would that help our economy and our quality of life here in the Inland Empire? Look at that. 2,180 job openings, 2,561, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we look at wages. These are not shabby wages, you all. So public health. And when you think about the, the different positions, it's not all epidemiologists and health, um, what do you call them? Health educators, right? There are, you're going to see several different, because even here we have the physician assistant. There are many physician assistants that are working in public health, not just in a normal hospital setting or a clinic setting, uh, but with the public health departments. So you can see the job postings, 551. Here's our current graduation uh, awards for our region. That's gonna change with Cal State in the fall. <laughs> She's like, yes. So um, same thing with community health workers, uh, the scientific side, because we know one of the hardest jobs to fill is the um, clinical lab scientists and the clinical lab, sorry, my brain just went blank, clinical lab, something. It's another one right under tech, I think, or something. So anyways, um, and because they're very science-based, uh, you know, they need a strong science grounding to be managing the labs. Those are difficult to fill. And we have a lot of 769 job openings. Um, this one, you're, you've already heard it like 10 times. I'm going to show it again. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I think maybe it's further down. Uh, so now I want to talk a little bit, reach out like Sheila is the backbone for the Coachella Valley, Reach Out is the backbone for Greater Inland Empire um, around health workforce partnerships and development. We have over 300 partners, many of you in this room. It was so great to see so many of you today that I haven't seen in quite some time of really looking at how we're doing that and how we're being more coordinated and what we're doing. Uh, so I just wanted to give you just a snapshot of a couple of the programs. And again, I'm going to go quickly. The White Coat Program is a collaboration with San Bernardino County Medical Society um, that gives young people a one week, very intensive experience while they're in high school uh, in a hospital or clinic, usually with a focus on women's health um, and usually at either some of the uh, private practices here in San Bernardino County or at ARMC. Work-based learning, as you all know, takes many forms. Um, and then I want to highlight the bottom picture because this isn't really work-based learning, but it's kind of work-based learning for teachers. One of the most important things to understand about health pathways in high schools is yesterday, I was a science teacher. Then my school district decided they needed a health pathway. Now I'm a health, I'm a health pathway science teacher. I'm a medical science teacher. I didn't get any new training, but here I am. Okay. And they're doing a great job. But most of them have never had the opportunity to work in a medical setting and or a clinical setting. And so externships are extremely important and compensating those teachers for their externships. Usually it's about a week. A lot of them do it during spring break or over summer. And they come back and they say, oh my gosh, I was teaching my kids all the wrong things. And it's hugely impactful to the classroom. But, you know, all kinds of trainings, getting our young people as many certificates before they get out of high school as we possibly can um, is also very important. Uh, the Health Professions Conference that we've held here many years, but also rotates to like UCR, Cal State, or I'm sorry, uh, Cal Baptist, 
Loma Linda. We have over 500 young people attending the conference and all mostly from health pathways in our region. And they get to hear about all the other professions. They don't have any clue that is out there usually. And it's a full day adult style experience and it's amazing. Um, and then we actually have one of Kaiser's pediatric psychiatrists up here, Dr. Evita Rocha, um, as was one of our keynotes there in the kind of red. Uh, she's amazing. And uh, let's see. The other thing that we're doing, again, back to public health, is we're doing the Public Health Leadership Consortium, which is both counties' public health departments, all the universities that grant degrees in public health, and the workforce development boards for the counties. To really dig deeply into this, there's a fully developed work plan around what needs to be accomplished. That's why we're doing the workforce report as well. That's part of this. And then our community health worker training that I kind of already touched on. And uh, we're doing that. Uh, I've spent the last couple of years getting certified through the state to actually have our own college, Pacific Empire College where the community health worker work will be. So we put a few recommendations here that we always say, you know, more collaboration with our higher ed partners. Remember us as you're writing your grants and different initiatives that you're doing. We are really great at bridging the things that teachers have struggled doing, which is like developing work-based learning sites, all of those kinds of things. We're also great at bridging young people across to different institutions and giving them enhanced experiences. Um, and then I'm going to, stop, I, too much, but just think about all of these. And then last thing, uh, every year, this is our 14th year, our National Innovative Communities Conference is all around the social drivers of health. Uh, it's the only uh, conference in the Inland Empire that does this, you know, and each year hundreds of people come to this conference. We always have a huge health workforce strand in this, as we will again this year. Um, we have another keynote that we hope to have uh, tied, tied down, no, that doesn't sound right, <laughs> to get confirmed pretty soon this week, and invite all of you to that. It'll be at the Riverside Convention Center. And I think that's all I have. That's my last slide. So thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. And I think we're ready for Dr. OT. Let's get right into that. Okay, nice. We'll try this again. I built the anticipation. I did that on purpose. Okay, so we'll go back to here. Um, hopefully this is, there we go. Okay, so this is where I was kind of leaving off about how we are at 41 primary care providers per 100,000 people. So we are still very far from where we need to be. So what can we do? And as I was saying, it seems like the obvious, most logical solution. If we need to increase the workforce, let's just train more people, right? Seems obvious. So let's look at what that could look like. Um, so it's showing some of my tricks, so just bear with me here. Um, so if we have two new schools starting in the Inland Empire in 2025, uh, we have a medical school with 80 students, a PA program with 40 students. They're starting up at the same time. What kind of impact could that have? So if you go through the medical program, uh, it takes about four years to go through that, then add on an additional three years of residency. We'll have some physicians entering the workforce in about 2032. Uh, now, if we look in comparison to the PA school, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, they would go for two years and um, enter in the workforce in 2027. Now, the projected impact would be, now this is very conservative numbers. Any, anyone in healthcare administration knows that a PA or physician seeing 15 patients a day seems pretty low, um, but I wanted to, to start on the lower side just to be conservative. So if you're seeing 15 patients a day, about 75 patients per week, each of these PAs or physicians could see roughly 3,600 patients per year. And you add that up across these new programs and you'll be seeing about 400,000 plus patients per year, just from two single programs. Now, if you add that up over time, you can see that here. And these programs combined within the first 10 years of existence, not meaning 10 years of graduates, but just 10 years of existence, can see over 8 million patients. 
Now, this is alarming. This is incredible. This is something we need to be pursuing, right? But the issue is that there are some considerations, right? <laughs> In fact, there are lots of considerations we need to look into, but I'm going to just cover some key considerations. Um, so I'm not sure why this is going like this, but uh, the support. Support is one area you need to look into, and that includes funding as well as the support of the local healthcare community. In addition to that, you need to think about the students. So in order to have a program, you obviously need students, and we need to think of both the recruitment of those students as well as the retention of those graduates. So just recruiting them to the programs is not solving our problem. We need to focus on retention. So let's dive into those a little bit more. Now to start, you definitely need general funding to get started. And the general funding goes towards facilities, it goes towards the faculty and staff you'd have in the program, the recruitment to get that faculty staff, as well as the training equipment. Now there is a lot of state and federal funding and grants available for that, but most of these are focused on non-personnel. So there's still an outlay of cash that needs to go in making sure you're securing the right faculty and staff, you're building the right team uh, for these programs. Uh, now, the next thing is local healthcare community. You need to have the support of the local healthcare community. In fact, this is part of accreditation standards for many health professional programs. Now, the issue here is that you have to build the capacity for clinical training. You can't have a health professional train or practicing in the field without these critical clinical experiences that they gain during their training programs. But the issue is that we have a lot of these programs already in Southern California. Even though we need more, we have a lot already in existence and they're all fighting for these critical sites. And as we heard earlier from Dr. Bennett, there's a lot of people leaving the workforce and they're already feeling the heat of having too much workload. So they're not willing to take on additional students and you can't blame them for that. So more and more of programs, training programs within Southern California and elsewhere are competing for these sites and overbidding one another to get these sites. Now, years past, we may be able to get sites for free. That used to be sort of, you trained me or I was trained in the past, so now I'm gonna train the future of healthcare. That doesn't exist anymore, or at least it doesn't exist very much many, anymore. So there's lots of uh, programs overbidding one another. And what that ends up leading to is increased costs for these higher education programs. And where does that trickle down? That trickles down to the student. That trickles down to what tuition looks like. And unfortunately, that's where you start building barriers and making these programs unattainable to the, the exact people we want to train. And so that's what we need to look into. And so one suggestion and one thing that's taking place in other states across the U.S. is a preceptor tax credit incentive. Uh, so how this would work, Georgia has actually had this instituted since 2019. Um, and what they are doing is uh, basically incentivizing those. That, now, obviously, there's lots of rural areas in Georgia. I actually personally grew up in Georgia, so I know just how rural it is. Um, and there's lots of needs for providers in these underserved areas. And so what they're doing to incentivize preceptors is that they're having them, the more rotations that they take on per year, the more they're getting paid through these preceptor tax incentive credits. And so physicians could get up to $8,500 per year and, um, and nurse practitioners and physician assistants are receiving up to $6,000 per year in tax credits. Now, this, of course, is not putting the onus on the institution to increase their budget and, of course, cause the tuition to increase, it's actually coming from the state. And it's a more unified approach to this growing issue. Now, in terms of students, talking about the recruitment and then, the, of course, retention, you have to look at the full life cycle of a student from being a, um, a college student, then a student that's focused on pre-health, to a post-bac student, to going on to becoming an actual graduate student and graduate. What does that full life cycle look like and what can we do along the way to support that process? So the first is, of course, as it was mentioned a couple of times, is supporting pre-professional students. And by pre-professional, I mean as young as kindergarten. Because a lot of us have grown up in the era that whenever we think of healthcare, we think there's two professions, nurses and physicians. And as all of us know now, there's so many professions in between here and there, and so many opportunities that allow um, those individuals to find the perfect fit for them. And 
unfortunately, a lot of this is not spoken to these students about until they're, until they're in college or post back. They don't even know these professions exist. So what can we do to educate students younger and younger to get them excited and on the track of getting to these health professions sooner and more deliberately? The next is decreasing barriers. Now, tuition is one thing I already mentioned. It's an obvious financial barrier for many students, but other areas that we can consider decreasing barriers is the number of standardized tests that are required of students because we know that there is a financial barrier to not only the cost of the test itself, but also the additional prep work that goes along in being successful in some of these tests. Um, decreasing the number of prerequisite courses to those that are solely specific to the program that you're going into. Um, trying to decrease the amount of interview travel. So there's lots of programs that you have to fly out to, you pay for hotel, you get off of work to go there, you have to um, play for the fight or transportation. It's a, a huge cost. And that's just at the hope of gaining a position in a program, right? And so that's a big barrier for many students. So as much as you can do virtual interviews, as, although we know that they may not be as, the same feel for the student, this is definitely an avenue that I think should be more uh, available for, for those those uh, applicants out there. And of course, talking about GPA, I, I'm going to dive into this a little bit deeper uh, later, but considering what your GPA requirements are and considering how reasonable that is for the students entering the program, and is it really telling us what we need to know about the student? Next is ensuring the admissions process aligns with the mission. So we wanna make sure that you're getting the students into your program that are actually excited about what your mission is. And that hopefully, of course, our mission is to keep students here in the Inland Empire. Do they align with that? Make sure that your admissions requirements align with that. Uh, also developing a bridge program. Again, talking about the full life cycle of an applicant to a graduate student and practicing clinician is developing a bridge program between the college experience, post back experience, through to intensive rigorous graduate programs, making sure they know what that requires. So it's not just the content they need the bridge program for, but also understanding what it takes and what implications that will have on their family and personal life and making sure they're prepared and have things in place to be successful providing intentional support for student wellness while they're in the program, making sure there's resources available at your university, um, and also that you're putting in intentional mental wellness breaks. These programs are rigorous, they're intensive, but there is a past, uh, I guess, mentality that the harder you work, the more grit you put in it, that means you're better, that means you're stronger. But we know now that you don't necessarily need to just crush yourself on the ground to be successful, that there's a lot that you just need some of these mental wellness breaks to be more successful and that doesn't say anything about your skill level or about your courage. And finally, creating a strong foundation for the future. So as programs, our real goal is to just graduate students, right? But we really need to focus on making sure that they're going to be successful on the future on. So even if we just, if we graduate students, we're not necessarily securing their success on their national certifying exams that they have to take. But you wanna make sure you're, you're specifically providing that support for exam preparation. So they are successful, they can get certified, they can get licensed. And you also wanna make sure they can secure positions. So having partnerships with local facilities, which is why it's so wonderful to have all of you here today, you're, you're committed to this, um, to make sure we can ensure employment. Cause I can tell you the most exciting thing as a graduate or near graduate is securing your first job. Now, I want to shift gears to talk a little bit more about our program here, our developing program, our Master of Science in Physician Assistant program, and um, talk to you about how we plan to address these, work, these workforce shortages here in the Inland Empire and how we hope to serve, serve the needs of communities. So our mission is to develop multidimensional PAs who can transform the health of patients and communities with cultural humility, compassion, and innovative leadership. And what we mean by multidimensional is that we are of course training clinical PAs, but we also want them to have leadership abilities and the ability to transition into different areas of healthcare, whether that's public health, whether that's academia, whether it's working for a pharmaceutical company, we want them to have the skill set to be able to transition into each of these careers. In terms of our vision, of course, the reason why we're all here today is to create innovative and strategic solutions to increase access to quality health care. We also want to not only advance the health, but also the well-being of communities. 
We want to diversify the PA profession by having authentically holistic admissions processes. And finally, we want to develop PA leaders who passionately pursue health equity and hopefully ultimately drive the future of healthcare. Now, this is a look at our admissions requirements, and this is what I was speaking to earlier on, um, on creating these admissions requirements to really decrease as many barriers as possible. So in terms of some of the topics I mentioned earlier, um, with less prerequisites, we have seven prerequisites that are laser focused on what we believe will create the strongest foundation for our program, um, whereas some other programs are in the 14 to 15 prerequisite range, and those might not be necessary. Um, so those are some things to consider. Uh, in addition, I mentioned standardized tests. So our program does not actually require any standardized tests. And some of you may consider that a risk, um, but there's been lots of research in the PA profession in particular that shows that there's no direct correlation between the graduate uh, exam GRE compared to our national certifying exam. Uh, so for that reason, it does not seem like a reasonable requirement if it doesn't show any true correlation for uh, success in the program or success as a future physician assistant. And then the other area I wanted to top, uh, talk about uh, just briefly is about GPA. Um, now, many PA programs have a single threshold uh, for science and cumulative GPA, which is typically 3.0, and we have that as well. But one thing that we deliberately added on to this process is to allow for the ability for students who may have had a rough freshman or sophomore year who may have been serving family members who were um, going through a terminal illness who were carrying three jobs to just try to get through school and could not get those grades that they needed to get. Um, we're, we're really adjusting for those kind of students because we know things like that happen. Or there could have just been a, a student who didn't know their direction and they were taking all art classes and it just wasn't them. And they finally figured out what their field was. We wanted to give those students who may be at a 2.93, who could do whatever they tried, take as many courses as they could, and still could never reach that 3.0 threshold, no matter how hard they try, and no matter how perfect they would be as a future clinician. So we offer this alternative of 3.2 prerequisite GPA, so just in the seven courses we require, as well as a 3.2 last 60 credits, meaning the last two, approximately two years they would be in a program. This offers an alternative for some students who would never have the opportunity to get to that 3.0. So that's something I would, I would hope more programs are considering. And finally, the last topic I wanted to cover is about aligning the mission and vision with your admissions requirements and preferences. So we actually have these preferences clearly posted on our website, um, and we wanted to align this with our goals, which is to increase the workforce here in the Inland Empire. So we offer additional considerations for those students who are a CSUSB degree track student or graduate, but also anyone who grew up the majority of their childhood in the Inland Empire. And we also wanted to open it up to those who are who grew up in a health professional shortage area or medically underserved area, because we believe if you grow up in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, and you understood what it's like to serve those kind of communities, and if you had a preference to serve those kind of communities, if you came to our program, you would likely want to stay and serve the Inland Empire because it has a lot of the same qualities of where you might have grown up. And so that's why we added that additional uh, uh, consideration in there. And we also said, even if you didn't grow up in those areas, but you like clinically practicing in those areas, if you are currently a medical assistant in the Inland Empire, then you might have a better proclivity of staying here as well. So those are some of the additional uh, preferences we have. And for our program, we're also providing additional preference for those who are in state or federal assistance as a child, who uh, were first generation in their family to attend college, which aligns really well with our CSUSB uh, mission and vision. And also if you have a fluency in Spanish or a language other than English, and of course, if you have served uh, our country as a member, a current or former member of the military. Uh, so that is just a brief look. And I, I did want to add one additional thing just to um, tie into Dr. Bennett's presentation earlier. Our program uh, recognizes a need not only for primary care in this area, but also for behavioral and mental health. So as we can from a PA focus, we actually have an additional emphasis in behavioral mental health in our program so that we can have primary care for PAs who are actually able to serve some of the behavioral mental health care needs and, of course, know when to refer as appropriate. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Sonia.
Thank you very much, Sonia. We so appreciate it. Such impressive programs. You know, it, if we could see these these ki kinds of practices scale, I think we could make a major, major impact on our workforce efforts. And I guess that's the question. How do we connect the dots? <laughs> um, what you've seen today is real excellence in terms of building out the program in a way that's responsive to the conditions of the workforce, the needs, the demands of the workforce, but also thinking seriously about the feed. The students who are in our k 12 districts today kindergarten included and preschool and in the womb are our future workforce. What would you do differently? What would you do differently? Um, and what, and so I, I, this was inspiring. I've got all kinds of ideas about how I want to connect the dots between what's happening in the Coachella Valley to both of your programs, um, because they just ring so true to what's gone on here. And thank you, Diana, for the landscape. It's scary to uh, look at those numbers, but it's the reality. Uh, we know it. Uh, we need to look at it often. I, the other thing I would say from a policy perspective is um, we look at the numbers almost from a retrospective perspective, but oftentimes don't have uh, sort of a qualitative checkup on it, what it looks like on the ground. And anytime we test out um, a workforce number and then go right to the hospital CNO or, or other leader, we find very different uh, uh, projections. And they're usually worse, sorry to say. In our region, 10, 12 months ago, the, the number of contract RNs being hired was 575. And we're a small region, the Coachella Valley. It's down to about three, 250 now. But with an aging and growing population in the Inland Empire um, and a retire high retirement rate, I think we, we all know that this is not anything that one of us can do alone. So we're going to open it up for questions. I'd like to start with this. What strikes you about this? Can somebody share what really strikes you? What stood out for you here? Good morning. Um... It is still, nope, good afternoon. I'm Damon Alexander, Councilman, City of San Bernardino. And uh, I appreciate you all coming out here. And uh, I see what you, your particular uh, data says, it reflects in the city's data and the county's data as well. Uh, I don't know if this is a, uh, what, what strikes me, what struck me the most was, which doctor said uh, lowering standardized tests, GPA, who, who, who said that? Yes. Hi. Which, uh, that struck me because I always ask my doctor, where'd you go to school and what was your GPA? <laughs> and I don't know how you, I don't know how you base that on lowering entry tests or barring those tests when the most important thing you can work on is the human body and lowering test scores and lowering admissions is a good thing. I, I don't see that. So if you can explain why that is like that, I, I would appreciate that. And Dr. Bennett, I have one for you too. Um, what was my question? Oh, pathways. I just happened to be married to a school board member and uh, I, I know what path pathways are now. I didn't see you guys partnering with San Bernardino Unified School District and they're the largest, eighth largest in the, in the, in the state. Oh, you said that? I'm sorry. Okay. And yeah, I was just wondering why do you don't partner with them? They're the eighth largest in the state and they have fantastic pathways. So I'm sorry, but that's it. Dr. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to address that question. And so I think a, a lot of what we're doing in PA education is, is doing our best to diversify uh, the healthcare profession because we know the more that our providers mirror our communities, the more successful in terms of the type of care and the better patient outcomes and experience there, there are. There's a lot of research out there proving that. Um, but there's a lot of barriers for uh, allowing diverse groups of students to actually make it into these fields. And as much as the, the old standard would be just looking at GPA and looking at where the degree comes from. There's a lot has changed in that. And so we're really looking from a holistic perspective on different things that make people good clinicians. And what, what do they need? Yes, there's minimums in terms of the GPA. There's still minimums, right? But we're offering different types of opportunities for students who may have had personal struggles or other things going on in their lives. So we're trying not to limit um, just personal circumstances that lead to that. Anyone who is supporting a multi-generational family and having to work multiple jobs won't be able to have the same 
focus on their classes as someone who uh, has their full family support and paying and financial tuition. So we want to make sure that we're supportive of those kinds of students who will be successful clinicians because they can relate to their patients. And they grew up in a lot of the same types of families that these patients grew up in. And, and I did touch on the standardized test piece. Um, you know, we do have a standardized test at the end. That's a national certifying exam. We do want to ensure that our students are successful. So that's something we're integrating throughout our program instead of putting it on the front end with a test that for, again, this is specific to PA programs, does not directly correlate with our national certifying exam. Now that could be different for uh, law school with the LSAT or the MCAT for medical schools. There's different research out there, but specifically for physician assistant programs, there is not a true correlation that makes it valuable to require that additional piece. And I will just echo the, the same sentiments actually with physician training. So this is on. Well, there it is. <laughs> um, so we found similar things with standardized testing for physicians. And so a lot of those requirements have been eliminated. It doesn't mean that there's not other markers of competency and success, um, but it didn't correlate with, you know, being a good physician. Um, and a lot of people, there are inequities there. If you um, were better resourced and could pay for, you know, more of the programs to get you prepared for the, the tests, you know, um, that didn't correlate to you being a better physician. So, um, again, there are board certification exams. You know, there's direct, you know, clinical uh, mentorship and oversight, and you do have to pass, you know, certain markers. Um, but it, they're really like shifting away from standardized testing. Um, and then to your question about the school district. So I will definitely be fully transparent that I don't know the breadth of all the school districts that we work with. So I do know that just for the programs that I oversee specifically in psychiatry and partner with, um, that we do have that relationship with Fontana Unified, but it doesn't mean that, you know, we're not partnering with uh, San Bernardino Unified, so. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if I can add to Dr. Bennett's comments, um, my name is Martha Valencia. I'm the Community Health Manager with Kaiser Permanente for um, Community Health. Um, I'd like to share some insights. Um, we actually do partner extensively with San Bernardino City Unified School District for over 15 years. I think um, our approach is to um, come to the table where we are needed. Um, so currently with some City of San Bernardino Unified School District, we partner on the mental health youth um, aid training, um, as well as um, financial aid support. Um, We've also supported them in terms of, you know, we know that it's very sad, but there's many students that are homeless. Uh, so we have, we, we respond to, to what our districts um, have indicated that are their needs. Um, a most recent investment is um, a grant for $490,000 for their Uplift San Bernardino. But definitely, uh, we basically look at the different communities to see what's going on, what's in place, what's not. I know that they partner extensively on health professions with other partners, um, but we're definitely at the table with them. Um, and you know, something that um, we haven't officially announced uh, that was um, just approved, uh, but we will be sharing more insights in the near, in the next month or two, is that Kaiser Permanente will be launching the Mental Health Workforce Accelerator Initiative. Um, so we understand that there is a shortage among uh, licensed mental health professions at the postmaster's level. We do understand that there's many barriers for them to pursue licensing at the associate level. Um, so we will be partnering with um, a university um, to support um, associate students who encounter barriers and decide not to pursue um, uh, their, their clinical hours um, by providing uh, full-time employment, providing salary in a form of stipend, as well as the, the clinical supervision that is needed, um, as well as the licensing um, study materials um, and fee. So we will share more in the near future. Um, that's very new. Uh, we understand that there's many barriers to pursuing licensing. So just a couple of additional insights, but I 
am more than happy to share more about um, you know, what we do with different school districts. Um, so thank you, Dr. Bennett. We are just one minute over, but if anybody has a burning question, we didn't quite get enough questions in right here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nadia. I'm with Assembly Member Rodriguez's office. Um, and a lot of times I go out to um, school districts. So we cover Ontario, Chino, Montclair, Pomona, and Upland. Um, and so I primarily work with Ontario, Montclair. Um, and a lot of times these students, I myself grew up low income. Um, and when they ask us, oh, do you know like a doctor or how can I get into this department or this special profession, it's hard for us to tell them, oh, well, let me, you know, connect you with someone. Um, so as a state office, I guess I'm I'm trying to ask how can we better help them um, or who can we direct them to, especially, I guess it's also personal because my younger brother wants to go into pathology. Um, and I know myself growing up, my mom would always ask me, well, ask this person, ask that person. But now I find myself that I'm in that position of how do I direct my little brother to get to this profession that no one in my family has ever gone to. And I see that reflected in the communities that we serve. So any guidance would be very much appreciated. The one thing that was mentioned earlier is a Hippocrates Circle. And so that's a, a program that we have and that's really what it entails. And so physicians will participate in that and go and talk to, you know, different schools to just provide provide that perspective on what a career path could look like. And, you know, we have a very diverse physician group and it's equally important to, you know, come out and the students want to see the faces of people that they can relate to as well. So that's a, a big, you know, focus area of that group. So happy to connect with you, you know, offline and, and share more about that. Mm -hmm. Diana. If I could just tag into that, um, especially in the West End, um, you know, we'd, I'd be happy to connect with you and talk more about Inland Health Professions Consortium and the work that's happening there. Um, this is one of the biggest challenges is a lot of our health pathways that mostly exist only in high schools. Um, are not in the areas that are in the lower income school districts. And because it takes money, let's just say it takes money to stand up a new pathway in a district. And then if you don't happen to go to that high school, and you may not even know that that health pathway exists and that maybe you need to transfer to a different high school, but now I don't have busing. Right now, I don't have transportation. My parents are both working arm as a single parent household, and I can't get to that other high school. To solve these huge numbers that you see here, not only do we not only need to not wait until high school, the middle school years are huge for young people. That is when most of their uh, ideas actually are being formed. And by the time you get to 15, you know, they're, they're a lot baked already. So if we don't get in there younger and get into more of our schools that need these programs so that you don't only just go to this high school, but it's available at every high school. But what we see in most of our districts, pretty much all districts, is there's one school within that district that is the pathway school, the end, right? So... If we don't change that and invest more, and that's why I'm saying, you know, invest more in the teachers who are doing this work, invest more, you know, when we have strong workforce initiative funds coming out, when we have all of this money coming out, you know, that it doesn't get down to the K-12 system to establish these things. It's all sitting at the higher ed level. Don't get me wrong. We love our higher ed partners, but we can't get all of them into the programs where we need them to be if we don't start investing earlier. So I just wanted to share that. I hear you. It's a huge issue. So, and I just want to add on to, to the earlier comment, um, the pandemic had a lot of impacts. We have a whole generation coming up that was in school during the pandemic and to judge them the same as we were judged, you know, and I'm pretty old, you guys, quite frankly, um, <laughs> 
you know, is, is not fair. They are going to be carrying those two years of learning loss with them for a long time. And how we accommodate that and what we do to address it is going to be extremely important. I see that with my own grandsons. They're 14 and 16. They don't get me. They went into full mental health crisis mm -hmm. during this time. They also lost their dad during this time. And they are not in school right now because of these things. Mm -hmm. So the stats you quoted earlier about, you know, I'm living that every day and seeing that, you know, and, but they are brilliant young men, but they have the trauma of all of these things happening that they will carry with them and the learning loss that came along with it. So I think it is important that we begin to reform our thoughts and really think differently about how we support our young people, especially from a mental and behavioral health aspect. You know, that was an excellent way to close that question, especially from the perspective of you actually coming up through the pipeline and then being an informant, an informer for your family. That is absolutely the case for most of our students. So that those questions are important. And I want to just add to Diana's comment there, the governor's uh, plan for career education in California was, that was just adopted. It's a good plan, but it takes communities to put the math together, to say, here's the deficit in our region, and I want to know how we hold ourselves accountable for spending that money well, so that students at the K-12 level have the exposure early on, and you can ask these questions. You can get involved in K-16 collaborative grants. They're, they're all intended to do that, but it really takes grounding it in intersegmental work, so that there's someone um, at, at the, the K-12 level, there's folks at the university level. Our, our work in Coachella Valley, we're thinking about multiple pathways to um, health care careers, two in particular, a behavioral health and PA pipeline. Just by putting a team together around the PA pipeline alone, we started surfacing students as early as uh, freshmen in high school who want to be PAs that needed the kind of support that Sonia is building into that program. We need more of that. We have to fuel that and create accountability systems instead of saying, let's let that that stream of funding come down and see where it lands. It's not going to, we're not going to do anything else that we connect the dots and really kind of create the formula for making it land. So there are vehicles for funding at every level of education. It's how we optimize them and implement at in best practice programs like this. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for your generosity of eight extra minutes. Um, we so appreciate it. Thanks to all the panelists. Excellent. Really excellent experience. We wanted to announce that we will be we will, we will have the PowerPoints available on the CSUSB Office of Government and Community Relations on our resource page, and the, all the information will be sent via email to all the registries and attendees here and the and our folks on the live stream. Oh, thank you. Thank you.